right, it is now time for a motion to adjourn with MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson, JP. Uh, welcome to Motion to Adjourn. Unfortunately, it is just me today. So my co-host is unavailable. Um, but we are pushing into a uh, very topical um, topic today, which is, you know, the information commissioner and uh, Patty requests. So we will be joined today by the information commissioner, Gitanjali Gutierrez, and um, she will speak to us a bit about the origin of Patty and um, the the uh, current situation that we found ourselves in with the Patty legislation. So I believe we have her coming on pretty soon. Oh, look at that. Bang. Good timing. <laughs> Ms. Gutierrez, how yeah. are you? I'm good. Hello. Welcome to the show, and thank you for taking time out to join us. Absolutely. How are you? I'm good, and I've seen that you've had a lot of rounds in in uh in the press and interviews lately. So hopefully you have a little bit of energy left for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So just kicking in. Um, before we discuss Patty, would you would you mind just giving us a bit of insight into your professional journey into this um field and you know arriving to become the information commissioner of Bermuda? Sure. I, I guess the first thing I want to say um, for some of the young people that might be out there is that I am a graduate of public schools in Kentucky in the United States. So I grew up there um, and went to college and spent some years after college doing community education and organizing. And then I went to law school. Um, and after law school, I clerked for a judge on the Court of Appeals in the United States, so I got a behind-the-scenes look at that level of decision-making and taught at a law school for a little bit, and then I went into human rights work um, because my heart is really in action and not necessarily academia. So that's when I got exposed to Patty Laws for the first time, was doing work around um, different aspects of human rights where having access to public records is an important part of the advocacy work. So I've always been very focused on human rights and good governance and I guess on empowering communities and democracies. Thank you for that. And just to give us an overview of, you know, the institution that is, you know, Patty and how it can be uh, instrumental to the people, if you don't mind. Sure. So, the, the Patty Act was uh, passed in 2010, and it came into effect in 2015. And it gives, it's, it's called the Public Access to Information Act, and it gives Bermudians and residents the right to ask public authorities for access to public records. So if you break that down a little bit, that's a lot of information. Um, public authorities include the government and then um, different kinds of bodies like statutory boards and committees or quangos, things like the BTA, BMA, um, Bermuda Hospitals Board, those kinds of entities. So there's there's been around 200, give or take, in Bermuda during the um, time the Patty Act's been into effect. So Bermudians and residents can go to those entities and they can ask for records, and that's information recorded in any form. So it might be an email a memo, an electronic document, a photograph, any any way that information could be stored in an office. If you're if you're if you want to go into one of those offices and ask for the records, you have a right to under the Patty Act, and that's called making a Patty request. Um, I think what's really exciting about the Patty Act is that it makes it a right. So it means that when you go in and ask for that record, if you ask for an invoice or a spending record or something around a decision on a procurement process, and you ask for that record, the Patty Act sets out a framework that means you get the record unless one of the very specific reasons under the Patty Act says it stays confidential. So it's not discretionary anymore. You have a right to it. And on top of that framework, um, that all happens in the public authority. And if you're um, if you disagree with the response you get to the PADI request, someone can ask me at the information commissioner's office 
to look at that decision and decide whether you have a right to the record. And if you do, I issue a decision and an order that will give you access to the record. And that's what makes it an enforceable right. Yes. And I, I think we all would appreciate that. Um, just to put it in context, how would one, like, if you could just go a brief overview of a step-by-step of how one would do a patty request, just for anyone who's listening that may be considering it and think it may be daunting. Sure, sure. So making a patty request is actually incre- incredibly easy. And um, we are, as a people, we love to make comments on Facebook or Twitter. Um, if you can write a question on Facebook, you can make a patty request. So all it requires is that you decide what public authority you want to make your patty request for. Um, You can contact the ICO. There's um, information on our website to help you figure out who you want to ask. And then you have to put it in writing to them in a way that they can understand what you're looking for. So you have to give them, you have to put in writing enough detail that they know what records or what set of records you're looking for and that's how you make your patty request. That starts the process. Right now it's free. Your, um, your request goes to someone called an information officer at the public authority. And you get, they may contact you with questions. Um, they are required under the law to keep your identity confidential. And then in six weeks, you would normally then get an initial response from them. Okay. So, Six weeks is for the initial response, but um, is that usually um, the time frame in which it happens, or have you seen some drag on, or is that the six weeks mandated by law? The six weeks is mandated by law. Um, in f- the public authorities can take an extension of another six weeks under very specific circumstances, um, which makes it more workable workable for them and if they take that extra six weeks they're going to tell you okay so it, it's a very simple process but you you might have to you might have to follow up if you yeah uh, if you put something in right so that's really yes you have to use your rights you can't sit on them so if you make a patty request you'll get an acknowledgement letter you might get a question or two so that the public authority can understand what you're asking for, or they might, you might ask for a memo um, about a certain topic and maybe what they have are uh, reports on that certain topic. So they'll make sure that they're getting the records that you're seeking. And then you get a response back. And once you get it, if you disagree, you ask for an internal review and the decision will, the initial decision will explain all of this to you. Um, So if you disagree, you can say, I would like an internal review by the head of the public authority. So that'll be someone a little bit higher up in the organization and they'll take a fresh look at it and you'll get, you should then get a second decision in six weeks. And if all of that is done and you disagree, You can email the ICO and say you want the information commissioner to conduct a review, and we pick it up from there. Thank you for that. And just shifting gears just a little bit, um, because on this show, we do try to kind of pull the curtain down behind, uh, you know, certain certain um, entities that people may not hear a lot about. And, um, you know, the information uh, information commissioner's office is one of those entities that, you know, it doesn't pop up as often. It hasn't recently. And so it'd be nice to hear, you know, the some of the day-to-day operations and, you know, maybe some of the uh, functions of your position that folks may not know about. Sure. So this office, we have um, seven people in the office. So I'm the head of it. And we have some terrific individuals who are investigation officers. And they come from all different backgrounds, human rights, the ombudsman, medical, finance. Um, law. So we've got a good collection of people, terrific collection of people, and they will, um, on a day-to-day basis, they talk to patty requesters and help answer their questions about making patty requests. They help conduct investigations when someone disagrees with a decision on their patty request, and they provide findings to me that are the basis for my decision. Um, We also Um, have other officers that help us put on public education programs. We do trainings for the public and workshops. 
We are also very, uh, we put a lot of effort into educational outreach. So we will go do information booths at uh, back to school fairs, or we will try and go into places where there may be people who haven't heard about their rights under the PADI Act and might have some interactions with different government departments, and we want them to be aware be aware of their rights. So we do really all of that on a daily basis. Education, we conduct the investigations, and we answer people's questions. And we also provide um, guidance for public authorities so that they can get get it right. We want them to meet their meet the requirements of the PADI Act. We're not trying to play a game of gotcha. <laughs> I agree and understand that. Um, just if for someone who was listening, who was thinking, wow, this, this sounds really interesting and I might consider it a career path. Um, what would you, you say is the pathway to getting into that line of work and you know, how, how demanding would you say it is? I think working in access to information on this side of things where you are working for the oversight body, any good governance body, um, you definitely have to enjoy reading and learning and writing. Uh, we get patty requests about every topic under the sun. So for one of the investigation officers here, um, if some, if we get a patty requester who says, I want you to review what this public authority did, Suddenly, we're dealing with a public authority that maybe none of us have dealt with before, you haven't dealt with before. You're dealing with a topic on a patty request that you need to learn about. Um, so having a good, healthy sense of curiosity, good critical thinking, um, any, any of the academic subjects that require you to read, write, and think critically gives a good basis for doing access to information work. And if you have any experience working in other sort of oversight bodies, good governance oversight or other regulatory bodies, then it helps you understand how to um, apply a new requirement to public authorities in a way that's fair and proportionate and also protects the rights of the people. Thank you so much for that answer. And just in your uh, career in, in this post, have you seen any like really crucial kind of uh, uses of PADI and and it kind of impacting uh, some to any community or government or you know just in general when it comes to Bermuda. Absolutely, and we have a series of videos that we did one year for Right to Know Day in September um, that are on our website, and I can talk about um, some of the things that we referenced in those. People may not realize, but. Um, the restaurant ratings that you see in restaurants now, um, as well as the listing on the government website of all of the licensed daycare and child care providers are things that arose after PADI requests were made for those documents. So uh, before the PADI request, you couldn't tell when, if you were looking, if you're a parent or nana and you're looking at a child care facility or a child care provider, you couldn't tell whether they were licensed or not. Now you can go on the government website and those things are now published. Um, there were patty requests made for the salary scales at several of the you know, sort of significant um, public authorities in Bermuda, so BTA as well as Bermuda Hospitals Board. And out of patty requests made by one person that went through a decision from my office, we ordered that those salary scales, the bands, be published so that the public could see what the compensation were at the management and executive level. So those are a couple of examples. Um, then there were things, we had a, a review and a patty request involving the business review at SANS 360. And that was a request that got a lot of attention and a decision that got a lot of attention because I ordered the business review to be disclosed. And it had a lot of information that was helpful for the public to understand when the government was deciding what to do about that very historical and important piece of property. And so now the public has the same information that people on the inside of government have and a decision about what to do about that property can be done, can be made together. And I, I appreciate that answer. And just on the flip side of that, um, is it any particular topic that you would 
decline like as in like if someone submitted a a patty for this particular topic would you have to say that's not within our remit or is it literally just any any particular topic is is fine um so the patty act what what my office does is the the mandate of this office is to uphold the framework of the patty act and so that's going to include where people have a right to access the record but it's also going to include upholding decisions by public authorities not disclosing the record and those reasons are laid out so sometimes um records that would um maybe in the procurement context a contract by the successful vendor maybe a lot of the contract could be disclosed but a schedule that shows the itemized rates or some other kind of commercial information that could hurt that company if it was disclosed that information we keep confidential personal information for um you know sort of just regular people we often will keep most of the time we'll keep that confidential and so those kinds of reasons are laid out in the patty act and if something is properly withheld then i will uphold the public authority's decision denying access and that can be frustrating for people sometimes the patty act doesn't give everyone a right to every bit of information there's very sound reasons that are laid out to prevent disclosure agreed and um i appreciate that answer as well because you know obviously this is a um a very meaty topic right because i know especially with the community kind of really buzzing about it um so have you what is the recourse then on because we mentioned before that you know the government is mandated to under this patty act to respond in six weeks and obviously there's probably other um mandates tied to patty if the government doesn't comply and i'm just saying any government in general doesn't comply what is the recourse for um, your office to take in that regard? And have you had to do that in your career? So I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Um, so far, uh, this office, let's see, we've issued um, a number of decisions that have required public authorities to disclose records. Um, the total number of decisions so far that we've issued have been 132 decisions, not all of those involved in order to disclose records. But um, in each case, we've required a public authority to disclose records. The public authority has disclosed those records. So we've never had a resistance to uh, an, an order so far. Um, if if someone dis- – if someone um, – is going through the patty process and finds that a public authority is not complying or they don't get a decision that's just ignored, they can just keep going up the ladder. They can ask for an internal review by the head of the authority and say, nobody gave me a response. And if you don't get a response from the head of the authority within the 16 t- six week time frame, you can come to the ICO and I will issue an order requiring the public authority to respond. So it can be a, I think the one um, disappointment or criticism of the Patty Act is that it does take a long time. It's not a quick process. Our law allows the public authorities to respond in six weeks and a lot of jurisdictions, it's 28 days. So it can be a time, um, a long, a prolonged process, but it's very enforceable. Well, thank you for that. Um, we're going to take a news break, and we'll be right back with you, Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're back to motion to adjourn. Ms. Gutierrez, you still with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, shifting gears as far as, um, you know, the outreach that your office does, uh, do, you, do you feel as though enough people are aware of this, of this right that they have and whether or not it should start maybe – being enshrined more in in school and education? So I think that um, the public is very aware of the Patty Act and their rights under the Patty Act and finds it important. Um, When I am grocery shopping or at Gorms or I'm, you know, County Cup in St. David's, um, people will come up and ask me to, uh, they'll comment about decisions that have been issued or they'll ask about their Patty rights or tell me about a Patty request they may want to make. But, you don't need to just take my word for it because the my office, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, from 2015 to 
2021 did an annual public awareness survey, and we put those results in our annual report every year. And people may be surprised to know that over between the years, between 76, 80 percent of the respondents believe that creating and enforcing PATI, the PATI Act is an important public investment. Um, kind of the same amount, 79 to 88 percent over the years believe that the right of access to public records is important to them. So I, I think that it's um, sometimes people think that the PATI Act is just what you read in the daily on the headlines, but it's not. Um, people, everyday people in Bermuda um, are, are very aware that they have the right to ask for information, they have a right to ask for records, and they hold it in their back pocket for when they need it. Absolutely. And so we've heard in the, in the uh, recent budget statement that there are proposed fees to be attached to, um, you know, applying for PADI for certain circumstances. Um, would you be able to kind of outline that for the listening audience and let us know how that, how that affects the current system that Wanda? Yes, and I guess I'd have to say from the outset that the devil's in the details, and we still, there, there hasn't been information yet coming forward about how this will be, what the fee would be, or how it would be collected, how it's going to be implemented. So it's a little bit hard to speak with certainty, um, with certainty about it. But painting a broad brush, it's it's disappointing that a potential change that is probably guaranteed to lessen the rights of people to make PADA requests has been undertaken without any public consultation or kind of articulation of the problem that's being solved. So from a, I'd say as a, as a head of an office that promotes good governance, when you're looking at good governance and public policy, you'd want to have a problem identified and then you look at factual data and kind of sound reasoning to come up with options. And then maybe a political choice will make the decision, will dictate the policy outcome, but that I'm, we don't know if that's what happened here. Um, we have a lot of data on the PADI Act. We know we know how many PADI requests are made. We know the topics of those PADI requests because the PADI Act requires public authorities to report that every year, and we publish the information in the ICO's annual report. So we know last year that about 150 PADI requests were made, and about... 47 or so public authorities reported receiving PADI requests. And those, I guess, from the budget speech and the um, the cabinet, the discussion, the budget debate around the cabinet office focused on the burden that public those public authorities, some portion of those 47 public authorities are facing in responding to PADI requests. And so if that's the problem, that some public authorities are having are struggling to respond to PADI requests, and we would ask why. And there's no records management code of practice in place. And so one question that might be asked is, what's the condition of how the records are kept? If it's taking hours and hours to find the records for a PADI request, is it because the PADI request is very broad, or is it because it's taking a long time to collect records that aren't being held that aren't being managed under a policy. And so everybody's office handles records differently. Um, the person who handles the PADI request makes a big difference. Is this someone who's had training on the PADI Act? Um, is it someone who is has the appropriate sort of skills and experience to collect all the records and know where to look and do a search? Um, are they given enough support and resources? Um, do they have access to the practice code and templates and things like that. So um, there's a lot of questions about why this might happen. Um, and if the PADI, if responding to the PADI request is very burdensome, the PADI Act has a mechanism to deny requests as being burdensome. And that's why I wonder about the training, um, because, it, because rather than making people pay simply to make a PADI request, you could train people in public authorities to know how to deny requests when it's too burdensome. And just just on that same vein, um, had you been 
consulted, would you have possibly been able to kind of navigate, uh, you know, government through ways or more efficient ways to to handle patty requests and maybe have given your professional insight um, on that so that they could possibly alleviate their burden? Uh, absolutely. And I should say that, there, that there's still time for that, certainly. Um, the Patty Act has a statutory provision that expressly states there shall be no fee simply for making a Patty request. So this, any kind of change to the Patty Act will be a process, and we are certainly always able to help consult. And in fact, we work with public authorities all the time on helping them handle and respond to Patty requests more efficiently today. My office conducted a briefing for information officers on how to conduct searches more efficiently and effectively. And we had two investigation officers, or we had an investigation officer and our deputy information commissioner talking about um, ways to simplify searches for emails. We provide guidances and briefings, um, do briefings on a quarterly basis for public authorities. And there are a lot of information officers who are striving to respond to patty requests and do this efficiently because they know today for you, tomorrow for me. We live in a small community. So people who are employed in public authorities and responding to patty requests one day may very well next week or next year find themselves making a patty request to get information about their, you know, auntie's pension or something happening um, in their community. Agreed. And just kind of taking it into more of a global scope, um, is this common practice anywhere else in the world where, you know, you have to pay a fee? Um, well, anywhere that has a, a Patty Act or information commissioner that you have to pay a fee to um, get that sort of information. So there's a, um, a program or a, an organization in Canada um, that is a de democracy sort of monitoring organization, and they have a right to information rating where they look at patty laws around the world, and they have these indicators that they evaluate them on. And one of those indicators is whether it is free or whether there's a cost to simply make a patty request. And of, um, I think that they have looked at 136 laws, and of those 14 of those laws require a fee at the outset. Um, and I know that there's been some pointing to Canada and the UK as places where there may be a fee uh, to make an initial patty request, but those are also some of the older laws um, that we have and don't really reflect um, modern good practice. Now, this is a fee to make a request at the outset. That's different than countries that allow a public authority to charge if a search gets very complicated. And a number of countries will have a framework where if, if you make a patty request and you can make the patty request for free, but as I'm responding to it, I realize it's going to take a lot to search for everything and respond to you. I can come back to you and say, listen, it's going to cost $500 to do this. Do you want to make your request smaller? Or do you want to pay the $500? And so that is um, a very, uh, I don't know how common that is, but that's definitely an accepted way of balancing the cost. Um, and in those jurisdictions, there is a records, co records management code of practice, which is not something we have in Bermuda yet. Um, there are, um, the records have been created often to facilitate ready access to information so it doesn't take as long to sweat to um, to search for them. And in a lot of those jurisdictions, a lot of information is just automatically put out to the public so you wouldn't need to make a patty request. Okay. So I think, you know, you look at those kinds of differences and then you imagine um, even if it was only a $5 fee, but if it's not payable online, you may need to go into the cashier's office in Hamilton. So right then and there, you've compromised the right for everyone on the far east end, everyone down in St. George's and St. David's, and then everyone out in Dockyard and Sands and Somerset. You're, you, you know, so it's those, it's those little things that if you're working in Hamilton, it may not seem like a big deal. But if you're thinking about all the people in the country, how it's implemented um, could 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 dictate whether someone has a right under the Patty Act or doesn't. 
Okay, and I and I agree. And I I just wanted to kind of spitball her. Obviously, we don't have any legislation or anything, but um, is it plausible and concerning uh, to you that you know this this um kind of rationale that things have become or petty requests have become burdensome uh, could possibly be used as an excuse to to deny certain petty requests because. Um, of it being too burdensome. So I guess the question is, um, does your office actually have the ability to discern whether something is actually too burdensome or is it just kind of government's word on that? So the the great thing about the framework in the PADI Act and really all, all enforceable access to information laws is that you don't just have to take the government or another public authority's Authorities' word for it. That is exactly the role of an information commissioner. We are independent of government and public authorities. We look at the details objectively, and we look at where our decision making is driven by the provisions in the PADI Act. So, when we get a case or a review in front of us, and a public authority has said this is going to be too burdensome, we look at the requirements of the PADI Act. The first thing we're going to ask is. Before you deny the request, did you follow the requirements of the PADI Act and ask and talk to the offer, offer to talk to the requester to narrow the PADI request so you could respond to it? That's the first requirement. Um, if they did that and it still could not be narrowed down, we actually ask very detailed questions and the public authorities are required to respond to us. Um, we ask um, how many records are involved? How many hours do you think it might take to respond? Um, is it is it burdensome because there's so many records? Is it burdensome because the records are complicated? So we ask a lot of details, and the public authorities then provide submissions to us for us to evaluate their um, evaluate their decision. And if a public authority um, does not provide us with the information, then we just kind of we will. If we have any questions, we decide those questions against them. Um, most of the time, the public authorities give us really detailed information. And to, you know, I also want to say that to the public authorities' credit, there are some who um, it was burdensome because they needed help to understand how to approach the search, and they want to, they want to respond to the PADI request. So in those instances, we will help them um, design a search so that they find the records that the requester is looking for, and then they decide what what can be um, provided. Well, that's good to hear. It's always good to hear that um, government's forthcoming. So yeah, that should yeah. That bring comfort to a lot of people. <laughs> Absolutely. So just um, just still on that uh, legislative vein, what are some you know red flags you would be looking out for to say, okay, um, this is something that. Um, kind of infringes on that right when it comes to tweaking um, the the petty act? Um, so some of the red flags for me with, um, I guess you're talking about with the fee itself? Well, yeah, and just um, because they're going to have to change legislation, um, yeah. you know, what what are some things that, you know, you would be looking at in these possible changes regarding the fee structure and other things that would you know, kind of raise a red flag with you? Um, I think if the fee, when we still have not heard what the fee amount will be, and that will make a huge difference. People are struggling to buy food, um, and this is, a, this is a basic right in a democracy to ask for information and hold um, governments accountable. So you wouldn't want to see that, that fee be very high how the fee is paid as a practical matter, if it's something that can be paid online or you can do a bank transfer and email in the copy of the transfer like you can with, say, public, um, you know, public lands and buildings or something like that, um, that's great. If you, have to walk, if you have to present yourself at the cashier's office, one, it's going to be hard to stay anonymous as a PADI requester, and two, that is going to mean that people will logistically have have a very very difficult time in exercising their right. So, if a fee is implemented, how much is it going to be? How is it going to be paid? And then also looking at whether the fee is applied to people in a um, 
not in a uniform way. So certain patty requesters will have to pay a fee, but other patty requesters won't. And that, um, going back to what's the problem we're trying to solve. If the problem that we're trying to solve is the burden of making a patty request, sometimes it's not going to matter whether the requester is a individual um, or the requester is coming from the media because an individual could make the same request that it's going to take just as much time to respond to as someone from the media. So I think that is another red flag um, that if you are separating out particular requesters and burdening their ability to exercise the right, that that can undermine kind of the ideas of accountability and transparency in a democracy. Agreed. And I appreciate that answer. Um, just more on the practical side, you know, how does, how does one receive their answers back? Is that also mandated or is, is that kind of what's easier for uh, and more feasible for government? Um, usually that in most situations, it hasn't seemed to be an issue. Um, once public authorities get to the point where they're going to provide records to a requester, it's usually gone relatively smoothly. Often it's just they're emailed to a requester. Um, every once in a while, a requester will want a hard copy, so they might come pick it up. Um, in the one or two instances over the last you know seven-something years where there's been an issue, um, Sometimes it's just been technical that um, requesters want documents um, in a certain technical format if it's things like recordings or if the number of files are very large. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to work out how the requester is going to get them because it can't be emailed. Um, we've had one case last year where a requester um, wanted to inspect the actual records and that wasn't really feasible because the information or the record they wanted to look at was kind of interspersed with a whole lot of other records. And so a copy of the record was made or the information was provided. And the PADI Act also lays out um, a little framework for that. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a great law. I mean, we were one of the um, last jurisdictions to get, one of the later jurisdictions to get PADI. But because of that, our law is very thorough and really models some of the... Um, the the best kind of model access to information laws that you see internationally. And thank you so much, Ms. Gutierrez. We're going to go to a break really fast and we'll be right back with you. Thank you. Don't allow money to get between you and your academic or career goals. Bermuda College's financial support options are available to help you cover the cost of your education. Care to hear more? Contact financial support services at college.bm or call 236-9000, extension 4391. The Spindrift Beverage Company started a decade or so ago aiming to raise the bar for the makers of sparkling thirst quenchers. Coming from a background of agriculture and wholesome food production, the founder observed that truly good, healthful food should be accompanied by good, healthful drink. Spindrift sparkling beverages are elegant in their simplicity, made from hand-chosen fresh fruit and tea leaves and pure water. We're featuring Spindrift pineapple on half tea and half lemon sparkling water. Lindo's, why go anyplace else? 94.9 Bermuda. Hour, 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 95. And we're back to motion to adjourn. Ms. Gutierrez, are you still with us? I am, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a more... A more lighthearted question, because I mean, you you seem very calm and you know bright, and I wonder if it's uh, any part of the job that you find to be stressful or tedious, um, because it's just you know when do we get to hear some in depth kind of work experience from the information commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, Yes, it can. Um, sometimes the work can be stressful, uh, just because I think probably most public officers can relate to having to do more with less. So our office has a big mandate under the PADI Act, and we're a, a tiny office. Um, and so sometimes juggling all of the work that we need to do can be um, can certainly be stressful. Um, but it's uh, luckily, I do really enjoy learning about different public authorities and about the different work and um, th this is definitely not a job for someone who wants to come in and do the same thing every day. So I love the variety. 
Um, I like the balance of talking to people about their rights and then getting to close my door and really spend some time deliberating over a decision and then issuing a decision. So it's a terrific mix of, of work for someone with my, um, with my interests. That's good. And, and that system um, with the, you know, everybody is obviously kind of maxed out, but is it uh, a way in which these the patties are delegated to various offices or is it just a team, a group effort? Oh, for the way that we do our work? Yes. So we have a, we always have a team of people who work on each investigation because we, because the decisions that I issue are subject to judicial review, we put a lot of effort into quality assurance and try and make sure that we're not overlooking any facts or missing something. So there's always three people, including myself at least, who will work on um, any any particular review. And then we do try and do, um, we, there's different activities that we will do as an office as well. So for example, in September, on September 28th, it's International Right to Know Day. And that week, we always do a lot of public awareness activities. And so everyone in the office from our project officer to our office manager and investigators, we all get together and go out into the community. So, so last year, our investigation officers were at Nellie's Walk and the Cathedral Church handing out brochures and talking one-on-one with people about their rights under the Patty Act. And that's always exciting for us because you you get a chance to hear from people who um, really value having this right. And that kind of keeps us going for the other parts of the year. Yeah, that's amazing. And moving into that, um, is there anything that the community can can be looking forward to from your office in the upcoming uh, weeks or months? Well, um, next, um, next Monday, knock on wood, we will be tabling our annual report. And that actually is something that is truly designed for the whole community to understand their rights and what we've done. Um, that really closes out the end for us on a budget year. And then we turn around and start looking to the beginning of our next year in April. Um, and it's been terrific now that we're moving into more in-person events. We've all been very excited about that. And we tend to look for opportunities to come to your community groups events if you want us to do a booth or come do a workshop. Um, and so our outreach will kick up again in April. Yes. And just um, what, are, what are some highlights of, of the annual review, like some headers that uh, people should be keeping their eye out for? One thing we're doing in this year's annual report is talking about the topics in our decisions a lot more so people can see the kinds of things that, that their, um, their fellow Bermudians and residents were asking about and those decisions. Um, and there's some highlights of our public education programs and there's always information in there about um, how to make PADI requests. And I would encourage people if you have not gone to our website, ico.bm. I would encourage people to go to that, watch some of the videos. Um, we have a lot of um, very user-friendly, accessible information on how to exercise your rights. And then people can always call us or email us if they have questions. Well, thank you for that. And I'm sure that, you know, the website looks pretty spick. I'm actually on it right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> So. One uh, one thing that's neat about our website, this is a huge project that we undertook this year. I mean, I should I should give kudos to our project officer, Sheeta Bassett, for this. Um, our website really models transparency by design. So you can look at, you go to the finances and spending under About Us, you can see our financial policies, our budget book pages, salary scales. You can look at our credit card statements and you can see you can't pick up the account number and go shopping, but you can look at the credit card statements with the account number redacted and see how the ICO um, has been using our government of Bermuda credit card. And we're funded through public money, so we're very transparent about what's happening with it. Yes, I, I, I know we all appreciate that. And just to turn the mic over to you before we wrap up, um, What's anything you'd like to impart on to the listening audience and Bermuda from your office and from you? Um, I guess I would want to say that, that the ICO and myself as information commissioner stand ready to uphold the mandate under the PADI Act to safeguard the rights under the PADI Act and ensure that the 
provisions are implemented properly. And we don't make patty requests. I don't make patty requests. People make patty requests. And that's so important for folks to understand. You have a very powerful right under the Patty Act to be informed and part of the conversation. You have incredible um, ability to hold governments that you hold dear or governments that you're opposed to. It really, it's regardless of the government of the day, you have the, you're empowered under the Patty Act to hold government to account, but you have to exercise that right. And as amendments are being considered to modify that right, it's important that people um, speak up and stay engaged. I agree. And thank you so much for taking some time out to speak to us. And hopefully we can um, have you back on after your uh, annual review to give us a bit of an update on everything and to touch base. Terrific. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a, have a great day. You as well. You be safe. Thank you, you too. All right, Don. I think that's another good one in the set. Um, for my cousin, uh, MP Chris Famous, I'm going to give a heads up to the shares that are coming because I know he's excited about these, as am I. So we're definitely getting down south to our cousins in the of course I- in Caracom. Uh, so you know next week on uh, let me get this right. Yes, there we are. So next week we have Damian Wilson, who is one of our uh, one of our cousin co-hosts down in um shoot hold on Turks and Caicos. There we go. So we're gonna be having him on, and obviously. Famous is everybody's cousin, right? So <laughs> you, know, you know that, right? Yeah. He said he said it was my cousin just yesterday. But um we're also gonna have uh part two of the history of St. Kitts and Nevis, which I I personally really enjoyed. So Mr. Leonard Stapleton will be back as well on the thirtieth. So with that, um I did hear I wish she was here because um Miss Gutierrez definitely mentioned, you know, the East Stand twice in her um interview so he would have been excited about that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> well he'll next time he comes here he'll he'll i'm sure follow up on that yes so you know with that uh good people we want to thank you uh we're heading into uh almost three years now three years. on the air mm-hmm. and i want to thank you know everybody who listens to um the show whether you agree with us whether you only agree with famous whether you only agree with me whether you only agree with dawn <laughs> That Everybody you, gets it. Yeah, that you you take the time out to tune in, and we really appreciate you. And keep coming up to us and telling us in the street. We definitely uh, let each other know when somebody lets us know that they listen, and we pass on all the compliments and good things that you say. So please uh, don't be strangers. You know we're always out and about, so you could always see us around. And we look forward to uh, providing the show for hopefully another three years. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. So with that, um, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. And we'll adjourn until next week, Thursday. And you have been listening to Motion to Adjourn with MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson, J.P.